I think from day one when I was 18 um I had read there was a newspaper called Metropolis on Saturday that Bachchi Karkaria used to edit and uh, I had read a particular edition of the paper I walked into the Times of India and somehow there was security was less those days so I got to get uh, I got to meet Bachchi I walked into her cabin um and I said you know I think your newspaper this week is rubbish and she was like who let this person in and <clears throat> you're so cocky and you actually said uh, to Bachchi and she let you get away she let me get away so she said okay you made it so far this is really good she was like now you can go back home or college to wherever you came from or you can help me make it a better newspaper uh and she offered me a job on the spot a lot of times people conform because people think it's so much easier to you know to kind of efface or hide or squash parts of you that make you you just to fit into what society expects um in terms of your behavior uh, for the past 3 years i've been on gq's best dress list and i write about how i was bullied and you know the same bright colors that i was teased for um are now being honored by gq um as like being fashion forward or whatever so i've constantly sought out bosses and mentors when i was at mit the legendary professor henry jenkins um uh, was not only my professor i worked with him uh, um he really taught me about how t- my own experiences were so valid i was very insecure in a foreign university i hadn't studied the humanities you know in a typical liberal arts way and henry was very he said but that's fine other people have that you have your experiences as part of your resume don't ever invalidate your experiences so i've been blessed to find mentors who have valued me um who have taken a call on me who have guided me um who have always 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 pushed me forward and now at godridge i have the same with nisa godridge you were listening to parmesh sahani and some of the narratives we touched upon while speaking now let's dive into the full conversation with him good evening and welcome to the second episode of personal journeys uh my name is charles cc and i am a co-founder at uh, founding fuel and today we'll be in conversation with uh, parmesh sahani uh the first episode of uh, personal journeys uh, featured ashish vidyarthi uh and i always knew of ashish as an actor but turns out uh, he's a motivational speaker and an executive coach as well among other things and listening to him uh, turned out to be a hugely engaging and uh, inspirational experience and he had so many stories uh, to tell us and i have no doubts it will be much the same with parmesh now uh, the immediate uh, trigger to initiate this conversation with parmesh is the publication of his book queerstan uh it hits it it hit the shelves uh, last month uh thank you so much for that parmesh uh, now parmesh uh, describes it as the kind of book where a uh, memoir meets manifesto and uh, the last time we spoke he said that there is much else to share about his life that he couldn't place in the book so this promises to be an exciting uh, conversation now uh, about uh, queerstan i've uh, been through it and i must admit to find myself squirming at various points um this is not for anything else but because uh, it is a very honest book and i am guilty of the many prejudices parmesh has uh, described society holds against the transgender community uh it is a deeply researched and a very well written book and uh, having gone through the process of co-authoring one i know what kind of mental muscle it takes to execute one parmesh please accept my compliments on a job well done thank you so much thank you charles and i'm really very very happy to be here um really happy to be doing this with founding fuel um i remember the first uh you know the first time that you all did a story so many years ago um in a sense um you ig 
you all uh, kick started the coverage of lgbtq issues in business india with that incredible forbes cover story that you remember so yes. you know from yes, then sir. i've been yes i i i remember that i remember that permission we and we're going to come to that we we will come to that so so what i what i wanted and, to and here we are and here we are here we are so 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 that's 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 the whole thing you know so so the book is not the only reason uh, we are in conversation with parmesh today because in his uh, a day job uh, at godrej is uh, curator at the india culture lab at tikroli in mumbai but outside the culture lab uh, parmesh is a researcher activist and uh, a writer now uh, for those of you who have logged in from outside mumbai once upon a time where the uh, india culture lab now stands uh, the place used to be a marshland but uh, what exists now uh, is an outstanding structure that attracts the finest minds from india and other parts of the world and just how did parmesh go about creating the space uh, how did he do it and why did he do it now there are others who are attempting to replicate something along the lines of the india culture lab um uh, and they started around the same time parmesh started work on this uh, but they couldn't and it wasn't for lack of funds or real estate clearly something else was at work there and now how did parmesh uh, pull this off uh, does it have to do with his personality uh, did it have to do with his uh, proximity to nisa godrej uh, would he have been able to pull this off uh, if he were elsewhere i'm keen to know about why and how and i'm sure there are learnings in this for all of us what i'm also but i also you know really find fascinating is uh, how parmesh has managed to stay connected with people across business entrepreneurship uh the creative arts public policy and academia and in fact i must tell you this uh, you know when researching this conversation i reached out to a few people to ask what they may want to know about him and the consensus answer was ah oh, parmesh you know he's a friend <laughs> now the thing is that uh, you know i've always uh, thought of parmesh as a friend as well in fact um, i've introduced him to a few people as well in the past but Uh, now that i think about it we've only met socially and uh, beyond that there's very little i know about him but i'll be honest about it his name evokes much warmth why it's a question that plays at the back of my mind now you know how has he managed to create this aura of warmth around him and how does he build relationships that are not purely transactional and i think there is much we can learn from parmesh about how to live and conduct ourselves and so that is why uh, while you listen to him may urge you to think about your own personal journeys as well until now and place your thoughts and questions in the chat box on zoom or youtube wherever you may have logged in from right now i'll try to get parmesh to answer as many questions as i can in the time we have and uh, whatever remains unanswered i'll pass it on to parmesh and get him to answer them on the founding fuel slack community so parmesh uh the first question to you um the it 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 strikes me and and i'm i'm just going to dive into this parmesh you know what does it feel like to be part of a community that has been always uncomfortable with you and has shunned you but you have from what i see of you you seem to be comfortable with it how have you fitted into this society can can you take us through it yeah so uh, thank you and um, you know the way i've always thought about it is i've always lived in my world and my world has always been homo normative so i don't know what it is to live in a heteronormative world um, because in my world in my imagination i just assume everyone happens to be queer until they tell me that they're not and i'm like oh really you're straight you don't look straight um so <laughs> one way of going through um you know a world which might be perhaps different from the way you imagine it is to like just 
you know, put your own construct on the world and navigate it, you know, as per your imagination. So since I navigate through a, I mean, the world I navigate to happens to be queer normative. Um, and so I'm so surprised, for example, I was so surprised, um, you know, when you came out as straight to me, for example, in the research uh, for this interview, uh, even though you have a big closet behind you, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, because I just assume everyone is queer. No, that's, uh, uh, but to answer your question seriously, I think it takes a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, resilience. Um, to navigate through life um, when you feel different from that of others. The truth is about 4 to 10% of any population happens to be LGBTQ. So there's lots of queer people in the world, right? Um, but the way the world is structured, the way, um, you know, schools, colleges, families, workplaces imagine themselves, um, you know, we don't imagine... Uh, for this diversity, right? So uh, I, when I grew up, I had no, I was very comfortable with my sexuality. Um, I was very confident. I didn't, um, you know, people say, when did you come to know? I'm like, you know, straight people also, when do straight people come to know, right? At some point you come to know, uh, you know, who you desire, who you might want to love and who you imagine a life with. Um, but when the world around you is not structured in that way, it becomes a little challenging. Also, in my case, um, I was bullied as a child. Um, and I, you know, I write about this in the book as well. Um, I was bullied for being effeminate. I was bullied for the clothes I wore. I was bullied for being smart and not shutting up. Um, so I was bullied, um, you know, when I was in school. Um, and I think a lot of times people conform because people think it's so much easier to, you know, to kind of efface or hide or squash parts of you that make you you just to fit into what society expects um, in terms of your behavior. But I chose very much not to. I said that, you know, I kind of like myself. I'm comfortable in my own skin. And um, there's nothing wrong in, in you know, um, in what I feel, and I'm re and I refuse to be squashed. So, and I write about it in the book how so many years later, and I'm quite happy that um, I mean these are home clothes. But in general, um, for the past three years, I've been on GQ's best dress list, and I write about how I was bullied, and you know the same bright colors that I was teased for um, are now being honored by GQ um, as like being fashion forward or whatever. So in fact, uh, um, in I'm not a saint or anything. In fact, Parmesh, uh, you know, there's this there's this anecdote actually in the book. Uh, if I may just come in there, you know, I just want to come in there. You know, there's this anecdote uh, in your book uh, uh, where you speak about, you know, how yeah. you feel uh, humiliated in class nine um, for wearing green Madonna um, shorts, uh, 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 and uh, yeah. uh, and that you you write that you felt uh, vindicated in 2018. Uh, by GQ magazine, um, and you wore the same uh, short, uh, you know. Uh, was that class nine episode a turning point of sorts uh, <laughs> in your life, uh, if I may ask that? Because you, you wrote very specifically uh, about that. Uh, can, you, can you take us through that narrative, you know, since you're speaking about that, uh, since you brought that up, uh, can you take us through that narrative? Yeah, I think that episode and also how I responded to it right and a lot of the work i mean you know if you read true north by bill george or a lot of the work on transformation is about crucibles and there have been very specific crucibles in my own life right one is um you know in school and this happens to a lot of queer people right um do you stand up for who you are um and articulate um uh, knowing very well that the cost of non-conformity is often um, ostracism, ostracism, being bullied, um, and so on? Or do you kind of um, conform and whatever, right? So it was, a, it was a turning point because I decided that I liked myself. I felt nothing wrong with 
how I felt or how I dressed. And I chose to continue being my fabulous self. Um, so many other people choose to not. Um, so for me, that was very much a turning point. Um, and it's something that I've held on to through the years, you know, when, um, when put in situations where I feel my authenticity um, is questioned, I always kind of gravitate more towards, you know, what I feel is true uh, and what I feel is me. Uh, because I think, you know, we, in a sense, we, uh, we have to find what our true north is. We have to find where our compass points and we kind of have to go towards, you know, in that direction always. And for me, my compass is always pointed towards um, a sense of comfort with my own self and a sense of joy in expressing my fabulosity through multiple ways, um, through my work, through my clothes, through my art, through everything. So it was a transformative point uh, <clears throat> because so I kind of used that op that moment in school um, to decide what kind of person I was going to become. So yeah, it was fundamental actually. Yeah. No, um, you know, I've, I've, you know, like I said, you know, if I were to just move that needle on that a little further, um, pitch the narrative a little further, you know, I've, I've had a chance to engage with you a few times. We've engaged a few times and, um, um, you have come across as someone who's, uh, you know, as someone who's very authentic. That's how you've come across to me. You speak directly to me, and uh, uh, but in your book, you've also described uh, yourself as uh, someone who was an introvert, uh, who was an introvert, uh, and uh, who morphed into a public speaker. Now, how did that transition happen? And, and when we last spoke on the phone, when we connected on the phone, um, you, you very specifically uh, uh, made the point about, you know, seeking mentors out um, and that there are narratives out there that you would like to share. And these are narratives that you haven't shared. Uh, there are too many stories out here that you haven't shared in the public domain. Can you, can you take us uh, uh, through that? You know, how did this transition happen? How did you seek mentors out? <coughs> Sorry, beginning yeah. from beginning no, to age 18. I totally, and I've been very blessed. So I think the transformation happened in for two reasons. First is I've constantly sought mentors and mentors have helped me. And second, I think over the years, I've become very focused on outcomes. Um, and so, you know, outcome oriented actions um, is what I do. Um, and But let's talk about the mentors first. I think from day one, when I was 18, um, I had read there was a newspaper called Metropolis on Saturday that Bachi Karkaria used to edit. And uh, I had read a particular edition of the paper. I walked into the Times of India and somehow there was security was less those days. So I got to get, uh, I got to meet Bachi. I walked into her cabin um, and I said, you know, I think your newspaper this week is rubbish. And she was like, who let this person in? And <clears throat> you're so cocky. And, uh, to Barchi and she let you get away. She let me get away. So she said, okay, you made it so far. This is really good. She was like, now you can go back home or college to wherever you came from. Or you can help me make it a better newspaper. Uh, and she offered me a job on the spot. Now, I didn't know at that time that the team running that particular youth section it was Rashmi Bansal um, and Lakshmi, and they were running, you know, the youth section called Indie. They left to start Jam, um, you know, the youth magazine. And so suddenly she found a young person and she said, you're in charge of my youth section, which is incredible. So I got to begin my journalism career with Bachi. And Bachi and Shashi both, Shashi Baliga and Bachi, they were my mentors. They were like my office mothers. They nurtured me, they guided me, they taught me everything I needed to know about, you know, news, journalism, producing things. This was in the days when, you know, we were still doing type on pages. Um, and, you know, I, I, at some point I asked them, I said, on what basis did you take um, a call on me, right? And Bachi said something which I have now used over the course of my life. Bachi said, 
you know, skills can be taught. She said, but, you know, you, I sensed an attitude in you. And I really wanted to nurture that attitude. What year was this, if I may ask, uh, if you recall? 1996. 96. Okay. Um, right? This is when Metropolis Moss was happening still. It, right. it used to be, uh, I mean, you know, it, it morphed into Moss and then, and then it became Bombay Times. So we're talking about Mumbai media history <laughs> um, at that time. Yeah, it used to be independent. So, you know, I've constantly, since then, I've constantly sought out bosses and mentors. When I was at MIT, the legendary professor Henry Jenkins um, was not only my professor, I worked with him. Um, he really taught me about how my own experiences were so valid. So my first book, Gay Bombay, which came out as a, you know, as a master's, uh, it was my master's dissertation at MIT, which came out as a book was completely because of his encouragement and this writing style that I've kind of, I think, uh, done better in Khairistan of deeply personal, um, you know, to push a message forward is something that I practiced in Gay Bombay because Henry said, okay. your background is valid. Your experiences are valid. You don't have to write in a particular way just because you're in an American university. Write the way you want, you know? Um, so it was very, very useful in terms of validating because I was very insecure in a foreign university. I hadn't studied the humanities, you know, in a typical liberal arts way. And Henry was very, he said, but that's fine. Other people have that. You have your experiences as part of your resume. Don't ever invalidate your experiences. So I've been blessed to find mentors who have valued me, um, who have taken a call on me, who have guided me. Um, who have always, always, always pushed me forward. And now at Godridge, I have the same with Nisa Godridge, who has really, really pushed me ahead. I want to make one more point here about not just mentorship, because you said, how do I, how do I get the confidence, right? Now, the truth is, I am very much an introvert. Um, um, I uh, don't like public speaking. In fact, for years, I struggled with anxiety and depression, um, you know, I have been to psychiatrists as well as counselors many times. Uh, uh, there was a time when I was on antidepressants and there was a time when I was so afraid of public speaking that I would need, um, you, know, um, you know, meds to just calm myself or whatever, right? So I've been through this uh, terrible bouts of anxiety. Um, and I have, but I've always thought in terms of what is out, what are the outcomes that I want to achieve? And in the kind of work that I do, which is communication, um, the outcome that I want to achieve is for people to be, to understand what I'm trying to say, and more importantly, to change their attitudes and behaviors. So I realized early on, whether it was the culture lab, whether it's in the books and the talks that I give, a lot of my life is about sharing and about communicating. So whether I'm anxious or whether I'm depressed, um, the outcome I want to achieve necessitates that I figure out how to get, you know, how to manage these things um, and learn how to communicate. So my uh, amiability has been a long process. It's been a process that has involved uh, experts, friends, counselors, um, incredible mental health professionals. And I continue, I'm seeing an incredible counselor right now. And I think it's very important for everyone who is watching this um, don't seek mental health advice um, or don't go to mental health professionals only when you're in a crisis. Um, I've benefited greatly from having counselors. I've benefited greatly from having a professional coach, which I did when Ted gave. Uh, Ted offered me a coach as part of my senior fellowship for one year. It was transformative, um, that kind of professional coaching. So for anyone who's watching this, the biggest investment you can make is in your own self. So please, there are professionals out there. Please go out and seek professional help that can e elevate your, you know, your performance to that of excellent. I mean, I sincerely urge you, don't wait for a crisis. Uh, it's an outstanding uh, piece of advice, Parmesh. Um, thank you so much. You know, in fact, uh, you know, when uh, we were recording last uh, together, the point you made, uh, you know, that I do only one take. Uh, you're like Sri Devi. That was the uh, uh, that was the uh, analogy you drew, and I was like wondering, how is this guy going to do it in one take? 
and uh, I was wondering, you know, what gives you that kind of a confidence? What if he messes up, you know? And uh, so, uh, so yeah, so this this place is much in uh, respect, really, you know, and uh, it's it's uh, it's really. Uh, so, so clearly, so so if I hear you right, uh, there is a lot of work as well that has gone into it, and uh, it is a anxiety-inducing process. Is it still anxiety-inducing, or are you now comfortable uh, where you are? Um, I think anxiety is something that you manage. Um, right. I think it's very hard to overcome. In fact, a friend of mine, Sonali Gupta, has written a wonderful book on anxiety that came out some months ago. Um, I highly recommend it because it's got um, exercises that anyone can do. Um, right. So it's not just about information. It's also like, you know, do these things and really basic stuff like list down five things that put you in a good space and things like that. Yeah. Have an happy, it's just really, really um, useful things. Um, so I work on it all the time. I have found uh, what I need to do to kind of uh, take me to, you know, when anxiety, I can recognize anxiety now. Um, I have found what I need to do to shift my, to shift me into a less anxious space. Um, one thing that really works for me is two pieces of dark chocolate. I don't know what it is. Uh, I found that it's very hard. Yeah, anxiety just goes down the moment you have two pieces of dark chocolate. Um, but you know, it might be something else. It might for someone else. It might be watching five minutes of Kapil Sharma, you know. Um, <laughs> but I think you need to find and kind of you need to make that your trigger as well, right? Um, like right, right. Pavlovian, almost. Um, you need to say that if these situations make me anxious, I know for sure that this is going to diminish my anxiety. So right. you train yourself almost Pavlov in a Pavlovian way. The moment you have the chocolate, you kind of feel it going down because you've trained yourself that, you know, this is what's... So, I mean, there are tips and tricks to manage it. I don't think you ever overcome it, but I think there are certainly ways of managing um, and it's outcome oriented, right? I mean, if you're a super anxious person and you don't need to do public speaking, then please don't torture yourself if you don't need to do it. It's just that for me, I needed to do it. Um, so, I, yeah. <laughs> Sure, sure, sure. So, uh, you know, so going back to uh, Kyrgyzstan um, and, uh, you know, knowing what I, uh, you know, just I was going over this, uh, you know, you described yourself uh, and your background, you know, uh, as a very, coming from a very middle class uh, background. Um, and uh, I must say that I, I, I empathize with it uh, totally, uh, given that I come from as well. And, uh, but this is the anecdotes that you have shared and whatever I've seen of you in your professional uh, part. Uh, my understanding uh, of you is that I would uh, I'd probably describe you as a connector. Uh, and um, now let me place that in perspective. Uh, yeah. uh, you speak of exchanging notes, uh, you know, the anecdotes that you share uh, in the book. You know, uh, on the one hand, you speak of uh, exchanging notes with uh, Bill Gates while he's in the pool on the one hand, and you're daily dallying with the sush set at Europe on the uh, on another day. And I know, knowing you, Parmesh, I know that you're not uh, making these uh, stories up. Okay, you're not you're not fibbing because I've I've seen you uh, uh, you know get down to uh, and engage with some really good names uh, at the India Ideas Lab. Um, uh, and uh, then on the other hand, um, what really, you know, I paused uh, when I came across this passage, um, when I was reading uh, that, um, you know, uh, there was this eunuch who was banging the door of your, uh, the car you were in. Uh, and uh, there was a massive traffic jam and uh, you just rolled the window down and took away, took out whatever you had uh, and just gave it. And you said, you know, hey, you know, this is just like my sister. You're just like my sister. You know, it's just that I've got the ovarian lottery. Uh, I've struck the ovarian lottery and you didn't. Uh, so um, two questions to you here, huh. you know, um, to me, um, a, you live, you, you're living in two worlds out here on the one hand. Um, one is, uh, you know, there's this world of um, people, ideas, 
making connections uh, how do you navigate that world on the one hand and then on the other hand there is this completely different world where i know that you know you, you know you are demonstrating empathy on the other hand and i know that you're not making up both these worlds these lie at two completely different spectrums how do you navigate both these worlds can you take us through it yeah i i mean i navigate multiple worlds not just not just two worlds um sure. i have a personal world um you know with my partner i have a you know my parents a family world which is very different i have multiple professional worlds uh, you know business but also fashion and lifestyle um you know i have friends across of all ages working in different parts of um the ecosystem right some are activists some are you know scientists some are in business some are whatever so i navigate i mean educational so i don't make sense of them i think i've tried to stop making sense of it i just um i'm just grateful that i've had the the life the background the incredible privileges to be able to access some of these multiple worlds um the way i navigate the multiple worlds is by consciously being aware so that incident where um, that you mentioned in the book when uh, it was after i just given a talk at franklin templeton in lower parel and um, as our car came down uh, there was a bunch of uh, hijras who do mangti uh, because you know there are specific professions at at, at this point um, which a lot of hijras do and this is because 92% of trans people in our country according to the last human rights uh, the national human rights survey of 2018 um 92 which cites the 2011 census statistics 92% of the trans people in our country who are able and willing to work do not find employment right so you have to look at it in that context um and so i just given a talk to these franklin templeton executives which is one world uh, and then i'd met a bunch of hijras who were at my door and i was talking to them bantering i was saying apne behan se mange ki kya and things like that and of course um, and i'm very conscious at that moment that you know it's it's there is a divide there is such a divide in terms of class in terms of privilege and in the book i reflect i say what am i doing um what am i doing at this point right how many ever talks i gave to franklin templeton or all these corporates is it any use if it is not going to materially change the life of my trans sisters on the street and what i do is i don't and this frustrates me but i try very hard not to be debilitated by my frustration i try at the i try at every moment i can to take my frustration and convert it into the word you used earlier connection what can i do using my place my position the access that i have um um the and the opportunities that i can generate to create a better world for different people and that's what i try to do all the time right um so i'm ac- acutely conscious of the fact that i traverse different worlds um i am i try my best in this traversing to connect as many people as i can and more important to build out as many platforms as i can um and that's how i don't resolve it but i kind of work i work through it um uh, i don't know if that makes sense but i think uh, for a lot of people um a lot of people go through life without even become being conscious of their own privilege we have we all have different kinds of privileges and different kinds of um disadvantages i think it's important for us to recognize the privilege that we have and then see what can we do with this privilege to make the world better for others um uh, you know so what i do is i try and uh i write about it in the book i call it jugar resistance yes, about yes, being you, you, yes, you made the point about trying to recognize the kind of privileges that uh, we have do you think you could just reflect a bit upon that because you spent some time in the book uh, on trying to uh, you know reflect that everybody has their own kinds of uh, privileges and there was there is there is a 
passage there, there is some time that you have spent uh, reflecting upon the kind of privileges. And where I'm coming at it from is that, you know, um, uh, someone who lives in the suburbs uh, may uh, think that someone who lives in another part of town is probably possibly more privileged. Uh, or for that matter, you know, there are various ways yeah. to look at privileges, but you have, you, 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 there was this part where you think deeply about privileges and would you want to take us through what went through that uh, thinking and how do you, uh, uh, I, I thought that was fairly deep and a lot of thought went into uh, it. Would you want to just share a little bit about it? Uh, because yeah, I think so it goes up in your work as well. And that is where I want to, I want to lead you down, you know, we want to share it some more. If you could just spend a minute or two on that, uh, on how to yeah. think about that, that all yeah, of us so are I privileged. Yeah, so I think, you know, um, you know, class language, certainly caste, we don't talk about caste enough. Um, um, you know, certainly in the business world, in the corporate world, uh, uh, you know, uh, education, I mean, you know, Bordeaux talks about so many kinds of capital, right? Social capital, uh, what Bordeaux calls habitus, uh, in that sense of everything that kind of makes up our um, our daily life, right? It's not, um, it is also structural. So I, you know, as you go through life, you recognize that a lot of the opportunities that you had uh, are because of um, either you were, you know, of the family into which you were born um, or the fact that maybe, you're, I mean, I went to St. Joseph School Kulaba in RC Church, which was seven rupees a month. It is still an English school, right? Because I'm, if I hadn't gone to an English speaking school, um, it would have been you know, much harder for me uh, to, to transition to the other kind of opportunities that I had. Now I had no say in, my, in being put in that school. My partner uh, went to a, you know, went to a Hindi, yeah, he went to a Hindi medium school. And then when he went to college, um, he had to like suddenly he went to an English medium college where but a lot of the a lot of the teaching was in Marathi so I'm just saying it's so much harder like you know in my case I went to an English medium school and a lot of my teaching was in English we don't even recognize so many of these things we don't even recognize what having a last name um, means um, you know, because our last names are so often linked with caste, right? The only people who cannot think about caste are those, um, you know, who are not oppressed by it as, um, right? I mean, so uh, what does it mean to have that? I think it's very important for any of us who are, uh, wherever we are located, to just recognize how much we are a product of our circumstances. Um, and then what does one do? And uh, Divya Kandukuri, who, who's... Uh, you know, whose voice I amplify in the book, talks about it in one of our cultural lab events. And she says that one of the things that you can do is share the mic. You know, what happens when you become conscious? You can share the mic. You can amplify other voices. You can help build infrastructures of opportunity for others. Uh, because, you know, and whichever dimension you may want to look at, right? So I talk about LGBTQ in the book, but the same would apply for PWD, persons with disabilities, the same would apply for um, for gender, uh, for gender-based discrimination. The same would apply for any dimension of um, you know diversity and inclusion that you might be thinking of, right? What do you do as an able-bodied person? What can you do to create a more equal world, right? Where can you influence? How can you widen that? Because when we realize we all care about certain things, we all have certain privileges. I think when we recognize how interconnected our struggles are, how, how in a sense we all want to create a more equal world in some way or the other, but we can be on that process together only when we recognize that us, you know, you might want to create a more equal world in terms of gender. Someone else might want to create in terms of climate change. Um, someone else might be really, really interested in PWD. I'm interested in LGBTQ. Someone else is, is from the anti-caste movement, right? We can only when we recognize that in a sense, what we want, our common long-term goal is the same, more equality. Um, can we build solidarity, uh, you know, 
between each other in recognizing that what we have in common, including our goal, is so much more powerful than what um, you know differentiates us. And then we can think about how to create this together. Um, so that's how I think about how I want to kind of navigate the world um, using my position and place and networks and opportunities. Um, and that's what I've tried to do over the past decade, specifically at Codridge, um, through projects like this book and, you know, through the lab and otherwise. Um, and uh, so, uh, and that is another part of your life uh, at the lab, for instance, you know, uh, as curator of experiences, um, uh, you know, uh, if I may ask you, what did it take to pull it off? You know, you have touched upon it uh, in parts of the book. There's a chapter devoted to it. And I have visited uh, the lab. Um, and, um, you know, you the last time we spoke, uh, you said that there are parts of it. There are many parts of that story that has gone untold. And there are parts of it in the book uh, that you have touched upon to create that kind of a space. Uh, uh, and what you, what you saw while you were at MIT, uh, and what did it take to create that? Um, uh, there is a story out there. There's a narrative to create something. Uh, uh, can you can you share uh, some of those stories to create that kind of a space uh, in India? You know, like you know, well, it was a marshland like I uh, once upon a time. Uh, now what exists out there uh, is probably unbelievable uh, to anyone uh, who may. Uh, uh, who may visit that place? Uh, can you can you take us uh, through the thinking that uh, uh, went through it? Uh, and I would imagine you probably would drive uh, someone uh, batty uh, uh, in uh, trying to make all those connections and that uh, thing. So, can can you, can you share some narratives on uh, how it was done? Yeah. So I think what we did with the lab was use design thinking. Uh, and really iterate constantly, right? Very much like the IDO way of rapid prototyping, rapid iteration with an idea. It started with a very broad idea of we need to create a different kind of public space um, in which we can have a range of conversations around what it means to be modern in India, right? Very much in a sense what Founding Fuel is doing, right? In that sense of how do we go in this direction? How do we create these conversations and so on? And then it was rapid prototyping. So I think the same kind of cycle that goes through for product design went through for the lab, right? We did a proof of concept. We did a very first conference called Urban Reimagination, where we had everyone from Homi Baba from Harvard um, to Alisha Bhatt, who is this incredible, cool young singer. Um, uh, you know, we had Namita Devi Dayal, who sang, not, you know, did not, you know, who sang and read, actually. Uh, so we had architects, we had designers, we had performers, uh, we had, um, you know, Gyan Prakash, we had Naresh Fernandez. So we had, we looked at what it means to be urban from the lens of history, geography, and community. And it was a, it was a full day seminar 10 years ago. And we said, will people come? to Vikroli if we do this. And we had 500 people who came and more importantly, they stayed. They stayed for about eight hours because this mashup, you don't know who's coming rest. Is it gonna be a Harvard professor? Is it gonna be a young singer? Is it gonna be a dancer? Is it gonna be a taxi driver? No one knows, right? That kind of mashup of speakers um, and the curation, you know, along strong thematics really work. Um, so at the end of that first conference, we were like, okay, if you, if you curate well, people will come. And then, since then, it went on this completely very exciting iterative journey where we decided to value transients. While everyone else thought that to build a cultural center meant you have to spend a lot of time and money and build a building, um, we said we are going to repurpose whatever infrastructure exists because we don't want to build for permanence. And years later, when I was spending time with Rahul Merotra and talking to him about the architecture of impermanence, talking to him about how he's inspired by the Kumbh Mela, where a city comes, does what it has to do, and then disappears, I was like, aha, now what we were doing kind of makes sense because we have a theoretical framework to put it on, but we were doing this before. Um, so we said, what if we don't 
value things that other people value right and what if we say that this idea of permanence itself is futile let us value the ephemeral and so all our programming became about extraordinary ephemera um so we would spend a lot of time and effort in building a pop up museum that would last for only 3 days or a pop up art experience that the day after it is created is demolished um and we said let us you know so but what remains then right what remains when you don't have a building and that what remains is the experience and the connection and we realized right. over over the years that those are very very powerful right um right. so we kept on iterating uh as we began to produce events we realized that the city was coming we said people need resources so we started producing resources whether it is white papers for transgender employment um you know uh, documents for the cities and the country's cultural professionals to interact with each other uh you know website uh we said okay uh humanity students in the city you know mba and and engineering students have all the internships in the world but for humanity students there aren't any we created a internship program for only humanity students so it kept on iterating over the course of the time but really by keeping these things in mind that what is what we value are the experiences and the connections and i think because of that uh you, you know the kind of as you said earlier made bikroli which is in any case a geographical center of the city uh, over 10 years we made it an important cultural node um, and i take great pride in that and it it's a, and also our programming is super serious so to have people come to bikroli for serious programming has been very very uh, i mean it's a validation of the fact that what we have been doing for all this while works my hope is that uh, other companies other organizations other you know institutions take the spirit of what we are trying to do right. valuing the pop up valuing connections uh surplus infrastructure right and i actually got this framework from a friend of mine sam ford who was also my classmate at mit and he does a lot of work with wrestling with wrestling fans with ww you know the american wrestling not the uh, not the doctor. olympic wrestling correct yeah the performative wrestling and he's realized that in the early 2000s right the wrestling federation uh they had always thought of their audience as white male 18 to 35 and so and everything they were doing was pitching to that but then one day they actually looked at who was watching and they realized that there were two groups of audiences who they were not even imagining one was women and they were like you know wrestling it's a whole bunch of naked men beat you know tossing each other in a ring uh, maybe women will be interested and they realize a lot of women were watching the second is gay men again it's wrestling it's a whole bunch of half naked men um you know maybe gay men and they had not even imagined so they so sam came up with this idea of surplus audiences who are the audiences that you have that you don't even imagine right so i've used a lot of these frameworks in thinking what is a surplus audience what is a sur- what is surplus infrastructure how can we Im- combine a framework around architecture which is raul merotra's architecture of impermanence with that of surplus audiences and come up with a format um which is ephemeral and yet so meaningful so a lot of thinking and work has gone into the labs iteration and journey over the years um, it's been great fun intellectually as well as you know experience wise um uh, yeah and it's been it's been a blast i've actually had a chance to use all the stuff that one learned at mit um in practice and i don't know many other humanists who can actually do that with a sense of achievement so i feel quite happy it's absolutely fascinating but but you know here's here's something that um, you know uh, you know while going over the narrative uh, this is something that i i was kind of trying to wrap my head around you know uh, the narrative as it you know that um, uh, you had when you got back you had all the support of um, anand and anu mahendra um, and um, uh, you also spoke about you know you had offers 
to uh, elsewhere at 2.5x uh, um, what you uh, currently uh, uh, take home. Um, and um, you uh, often, uh, you've often articulated your, you know, that uh, you uh, just want to leave everything and go abroad. Uh, now, this is something I just don't get. On the one hand, you know, you just spoke about, you know, the, the, the absolute passion with which you speak about, uh, you know, what it took to build uh, the, the, the culture lab. Uh, you devoted a chapter to, uh, uh, to, the, to the Godej. You chose to stick to Godej. Now, as, as someone listening into this narrative, how am I to interpret this? I mean, what does... What does this tell me? I mean, uh, does is this does this speak something about? Uh, is this is this uh, you know? Is there a dichotomy in this narrative? Uh, is this uh, is this some articulating some frustration uh, in your mind about India as a society? Uh, what is it? Uh, what is the what is the underpinning to this narrative really? Or what am I to make out of it? Yeah, so this is I... this frankly had me stumped. Good. I hope that makes you read the book again. <laughs> um, no, well, why should I? You, I'm asking you, Pandla. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. So good. Uh, it's a good question. I, I'm always. I'm always. The truth is, I'm always tussling on any given day. You know, and I'm, I'm always walking this line between here, there, before, after, theory, practice. Um, uh, you know, stay, uh, leave, uh, I'm, you know, one is always, and also into a work I do, you know, and in the LGBTQ space as well, right? You hear of such incredible stories of change and courage and optimism, but you also hear of terrible stories. So right. each day is, a is this tussle, uh, of course, on certain days, it feels so much better to think maybe one should go to Canada. I mean, of course, this is imagining that there are no issues in Canada. Uh, I'm not saying America, as you might have noticed. Uh, um, but, you know, just imagining that maybe utopia is somewhere else. Uh, and it's comforting on certain days to say, you know, why, let me just go somewhere else and it will all be fine. Knowing fully well that, you know, everywhere we have our challenges and we have, um, you know, our opportunities everywhere. Um, so I go through this every day. Um, I share it very openly. <laughs> uh, so if you have sensed that tension, it's, it's true. Um, on any given day, uh, uh, you know, there is incredible things of hope um, in our country. Um, but there's also great challenges, right? So uh, it's something that I'm that I'm dealing with all the time. Uh, in terms of, but when I look back, right? I've been here. Um, I've been I've been here for ten years. Uh, I've tried to make a difference for ten years. Uh, I'm not. I've been at Godridge. Uh, I did not succumb, although it was a very good offer. Uh, <laughs> So I'm here. I'm still in Vikroli <laughs> as of now. But if anyone is watching, you know, including, you know, that was 2.5x. Maybe for 3.5x. Yeah, right, right, right. You're making a you're making a sales <laughs> pitch out here. You're making a sales pitch out here. But hey, hang on. So so let me just okay before before I let you go. Before I let you go. Before I let you go. Uh, Parmesh, uh, you know, if you recall the first time, uh, some of us in, had engaged. You know, uh, you recall um, there's Indrajit, um, IG. At, you know, Tony Kiel, my other co-founder, me, and a couple of us, uh, my other colleagues. Um, uh, uh, that was way back in 2011 um, when we were at uh, Forbes, um, and uh, you were an activist and um, and engaged uh, and, uh, and an evangelist for the community. Um, and uh, now we are here in 2020. We're having this conversation in 2020. Um, or what have you learned? What have your learnings been in these uh, nine years? You had written an essay for us then about uh, where does uh, the community stand? Uh, but what are the harsh, uh, what, does, what is the truth for you? Uh, how, how much has the needle 
moved as far as you are concerned. Uh, uh, what do you have to say about the business community? Uh, because uh, sometimes uh, they can be hidebound, if I may use the word. Uh, has that been your experience? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what have your learnings been? So my learnings have been that I think, um, I mean, it's been a whirlwind journey in terms of the law, right? If, since that article came out, right? since that article came out, that article came out in an India in which we had the 2009 judgment. So it was it was legal to be queer in India when that article came out. Since then, we've had a 2013 judgment with overruled it, a 2014 positive NALSA judgment, a 2017 right to privacy, and the 2018 Section 377 judgment. So the law has changed so much. In the context of this law, I have seen corporate India change dramatically in terms of intent. So you can hear me, right? Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, so corporate India has changed dramatically in terms of its intent. It has changed, especially after the 2018 verdict. Um, there is a recognition. And, you know, I hope my book uh further is that that being inclusive is a good thing to do in terms of money you know there's enough data in terms of innovation in terms of attracting talent all across corporate india people recognize that including lgbtq inclusion which is a good thing but i think a lot of work needs to be done in how that intent is translated into action a lot of organizations think that just having that good intent um, or maybe just changing your policy on paper, um, you know, is enough. And what a lot of organizers need to realize is that you need to do a lot of things, right? You need all the policy changes. You need to create a culture of inclusion by having these conversations. You need to support LGBTQ organizations wherever you are, um, because a lot of LGBTQ, especially trans organizations, need your help. And you need to actively hire queer people. When you actively hire us, we will tell you what to do. So if you need a transgender washroom, we will tell you. Um, you know, if we need certain policies that need to be changed to cover for gender affirmation, we will tell you. You need to hire us, more and more of us, including in positions of power, so we can help the organization grow. So I, th I think a lot of the work in corporate India needs to be done on that. In larger society, I think a lot of now work needs to be done at intersections where you need to build partnerships between governments, uh, companies, and NGOs. For example, Grace Banu, who's an incredible activist in Tamil Nadu, has just last week set up uh, Sandeep Nagar, which is a transgender dairy cooperative, which the land has been provided by the government of Tamil Nadu. Uh, there are cows. There is a full dairy setup, which trans people operate, um, right? It's an incredible initiative. It is giving employment and respectability to trans people. Um, it is helping Tamil Nadu do its work of upskilling. So everyone wins in this, right? This is helping the companies because the whatever comes out of this dairy cooperative will be sold. It's a for-profit venture. So I think a lot of now work needs to be done in win-win scenarios where everyone wins, where companies win, where governments win, where activists win. Ultimately, individuals flourish. So I think what I want to see and what I haven't seen enough of in the past 10 years are these innovative win-win scenarios. We have seen the law change. We have seen media change. Uh, we have seen more acceptance for sure. Um, we have seen 200 books, for example, and so many movies and all of that. Now we need to go out and actually create win-win scenarios so that people's lives can fundamentally change. Um, and I want to see more of that faster. <laughs> Parmesh, uh, thank you so much for sharing as much as you have. It has been lovely talking to you. And uh, uh, once again, I must reiterate what a lovely book it is. Uh, and uh, we're going to stay connected. And I'm going to urge everyone uh, to pick this book up. Like I said, right at the outset, this is an absolutely uh, well-written and deeply researched book. 
thank you so much parmesh it's been it's been absolutely fantastic talking to you and may i urge everyone uh to please uh join the slack channel uh the founding fuel learning community and whatever questions that you may have on your mind uh, that you may want to ask of parmesh please do post it on the slack channel and every uh, question everyone who answers who has every question has to send me one piece of dark chocolate remember 